what's up everybody and welcome back to Thy Grind Home Syndicate, a horror folktale podcast. And as you can tell, we are still in the 1600s. We just finished up our Fear Street trilogy with Sarah Fear in 1666 and I uh, guess we got Witchcraft Fever. Yeah, I just, I, I literally, while the music was playing, I just realized this is the second movie in a row that takes place in the 1600s about a witch. Yep. Uh, I am your host, a fresh batch of flying baby goo, and that is my co-host, Satan, who is wearing his best goat disguise. It's it's Black Phillip. Did you get that at uh, Spirit Halloween? I cost him. I did. Spe- the, well, good quality. I special ordered the horns. Yeah. Uh, but we hope you guys enjoyed our Fear Street trilogy episodes. We had been wanting to do those for a very long time. You guys seem to enjoy it because the download numbers look really good. So thank you. But it was time to move on. And this week we are covering Robert Eggers. The Witch from 2015. The VV Itch. VV Itch. Good God, I am so worn out from researching this movie. There is a lot of information on this. And I had spent, you know, three weeks before researching all the Fear Street stuff because Netflix doesn't really put out a lot of info. Oh, I'm kind of tired. And and this was the icing on the cake for me. We got to do something easy next week. Something that doesn't require much research. I wonder what's easy. I feel like every time we think a movie is going to be easy, it ends up being the opposite. Oh, we got to pick something. I didn't think this movie would be that bad. Oh, man. I, I didn't think American Psycho would be that bad either, and it was it was uh, awful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I had to, I ended up reading stuff about the, the Bible and how the Bible, like there's stuff from the Bible that they did in this movie that, yeah, I don't know, a lot of shit that went right over my head. So it was a lot, a lot of stuff going on here. Maybe I should just quit picking movies. <laughs> I mean, no, uh, I mean, there is, I like the movie way more ever since I've learned all this stuff then I've seen the movie and I've put it all together. And it's so much better than when I originally watched it. Yeah, this this movie ages like wine for me. Uh, you know this story, but me and Brooke went and seen this for our first actual date when it came out in movie theaters. And uh, it was billed that the advertisement for this movie was incredible. It was billed as the scariest movie in, in that decade. And came out of the movie theater, and I was like, God damn, that was fucking awful. I hated it. <laughs> I didn't understand half of what was said. It was, like, really boring at times. I was like, that... And it, it, what had happened is I had such a... Because I was excited. I love witch movies. And then this new one came out, and it was billed as, like, this super dark, scariest movie in the last decade. And then I go to the movies, and I was just bound to be let down and not being able to understand half the movie is really difficult yeah but, it it's hard to know what's going on i mean they're saying words that i had never even heard before yeah so i watched thy movie again years later it took years to rewatch it and i loved it and every time i've watched it since then um i enjoy it more and then Watching it like really in depth for the podcast, uh, even more. It's a good movie. Yeah, and I I just recently heard a recommendation to watch it with the subtitles on, and so I came home and I mentioned that to you, and uh, I watched it this time with the subtitles on, and it was even better because at least at least I could kind of decipher some of the weird the the way they say stuff weird. I could kind of decipher it. If I could read it, then that's because they have like really thick English accents too. So it makes it even harder. You know, doing it for the podcast and and really having to understand everything that's going on, unlike other times where you can just kind of let something slide. 
I'm not going to lie. I looked up quite a few words. <laughs> had to look up some meanings. Even with subtitles, uh, it had, I guess I failed English, old English class. Uh, yeah, so we're going to jump right into it because there is a lot to talk about with this. Lots of witchcraft. But first, if you want to stay up to date on what is going on with us or the show, talk about or submit your movie request, or just say hey, you can always find us at one of our social media accounts or our official website at grindhousehorrorpod.com. Facebook at the Grindhouse Syndicate Horror Podcast, Instagram at grindhousesyndicate.horror.pod, and many more, which you can find links for in the show notes as always. And please subscribe or follow for alerts on new episodes. And if you really love us and don't want us to be kicked out of our super religious settlement and have to live next to some creepy woods, give us a review. Uh, The Witch is a 2015 folk horror film written and directed by Robert Eggers in his feature directorial debut. It stars Anya Taylor-Joy in her film debut. It was distributed by A24 and Elevation Pictures with the cinematography by Jarn Blasik, who, if you don't know who he is, he did um, The Lighthouse, which is another very uh, beautiful movie, uh, all black and white. Uh, Knock at the Cabin, so M. Night Shyamalan. Was that last year? That was last year. Yeah. Yes, it was. And he is also, this is awesome, he is also doing the cinematography for the up-and-coming Nosferatu. So that's going to be awesome. Yeah, he, he shoots some, uh, some beautiful movies. The story is set in 1630s New England, and its plot follows a Puritan family who encounter forces of evil in the woods beyond their farm. Don't, don't you hate when, when that happens, when you get forces of evil behind your house? Yeah, it happened to me last week, and it was it was a fucking mess. You get the broom, guy here. Forces of evil. This is this is why I had to special order these horns. So so they were uh, sh- Spirit Halloween didn't have any sharp enough to impale a human. Everything at Spirit Halloween's like kid. It's like kind of you know. I got that. Uh, I got that trick or treat candy bar knife. Super dull. <laughs> That's not it's even a knife. Super dull. <laughs> Remember, I didn't even realize. I think you showed me that it like comes apart, and there was a little blade and the blade inside. I was mm-hmm. like, I didn't even realize that. Uh, an international co-production of the United States and Canada, the film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival on January twenty seventh of two thousand fifteen, and was widely released by A twenty four on February nineteenth, two thousand sixteen. It was a critical and financial success, grossing. $40 million against a $4 million budget and is considered by some to be one of the best horror films of the 2010s. It made $40 million. And it was like, man, that's a big deal. I'm pretty sure Blumhouse's Megan made like $140 or $160 million last year. Yeah. How the fuck does that happen because- when a movie this good only makes 40 how much? Wonder what the budget for for Blumhouse's Megan was. Oh, so, it's it's way more because but, this is a thousand percent return. You may, you pay four million dollars and make forty million. You have just made a thousand percent. Yeah, but put into it, that many more people went to go see Megan in the theaters than they went and seen The uh, Witch. Yeah, because it's fucking Blumhouse. I mean, a hundred million dollars more people. That's unreal. That's just mind blowing. This movie, yeah, forty million dollars is good, but this movie should have made like a hundred million dollars. Like it, it was that good. No, I agree. I agree. This is definitely more of an independent film, and that's, I guess, not the mainstream's taste. And, and anything Blumhouse does now, because their name is so big, and not. Uh, I, well, I don't know. I guess they were fucking shit up when Megan came out, but a lot, lot more money to get the word out. So Eggers, who lived in New Hampshire, was inspired to write the film by his childhood fascination with witches and his frequent visit to the Plymouth Plantation as a child. 
The production team worked extensively with British and American museums, as well as consulting experts on 17th century Bridget, Br Bridget, British agriculture. Eggers wanted the set to be as historically accurate as possible, so he brought in a thatcher and a carpenter from Virginia and Massachusetts who had the knowledge and experience building in the style of the film's period. Were they Amish? Don't know. Is that um, offensive? Although Eggers wanted to film the picture on location in New England, uh, New England did not uh, hand out those tax credits, unfortunately. So he had to settle for Canada. Mm. Uh, yeah. Hey. Nah. Uh, this proved to be a problem, though, because he could not find the forest environment he was looking for. He eventually began scouting off of the map and found a suitable location that was extremely remote in Ontario. The casting took place in England as Eggers wanted authentic accents to represent a family who recently arrived in a colonial Plymouth area. To give the film an authentic look, Eggers shot only with natural light, meaning the only light indoors was candles. He also chose to stylize the film's title as The Witch with the two V's instead of the W, stating that he found this spelling in a Jacobin era pamphlet on witchcraft, among other period text. In December of 2013, costume designer, designer Linda Murr joined the crew and consulted 35 books and the clothes of the common people in Elizabethan and early Stuart England series to plan the costumes. All the costumes were made with wool, linen, and hemp. She also lobbied for a much larger costume budget. A24 acquired the film's distribution rights after it received very positive reactions in advanced screenings. A24 decided to give the film a wide theatrical release in the United States, which occurred on February 19th, 2016. Man, that was a, that's a while ago now, thinking thinking about it. This, this movie's been out for quite some time. Yeah, it's been a while. Was it just released uh, theatrically in the U.S.? Uh, no, it was released in uh, Canada as well. It was uh, A24 didn't do the Canada release. Um, the Elevation uh, Elevation Pictures did the Canada release. Well, for it only being the U.S. and Canada, $40 million sounds a lot better. Yeah. Uh, the Blu-ray special features includes outtakes and audio commentary by Eggers, a making of documentary called The Witch, a primal folk tale, and a 30-minute question and answer session featuring Eggers, Taylor Joy, and historians, uh, or the two historians who worked on the film. Man, the, the old English language in this movie, I mean, I gotta hand it to all the, all four or five of the actors in this movie. They did an incredible, incredible job. If I was an actor and I got this script, I would be like, how in the fuck am I going to do this? And for this to be Anya Taylor-Joy's first movie, big time mm -hmm. movie, um, yeah, hats off to her. I was, you know, I had this at the end of the episode, but this woman deserves a fucking Oscar for her performance in this. She was incredible. She was 18 years old when they did this movie, and it's kind of crazy, but her audition tape was the first audition tape that Eggers watched for this audition. Man, I don't think this movie would be what it is without her. Like, what she brought to this movie and the way she was able to play the part, it was so genuine. It, it just felt real. Yeah, I I think the the father, William, and, and her really... They really have a lot of emotion in their acting in this. Yeah, and just those two characters' dynamics together are very, also genuine. It's very real. You know, that's his 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 daughter, and they play that part very well. Those two together made this movie, because this is a very hard movie to act out, especially with the language. And uh, they had a lot of chemistry. I thought they did really good. 
Yeah, and that's not to say the the rest of the cast was not also phenomenal because they were. I don't think that there is a single, you know, at least main character wise, there isn't really a single even mediocre acting in this. Maybe the two little children because they're children, but they're because they're annoying as fuck. Yeah. Yeah, the the mom, Catherine, the lady who played her, played a great, miserable, resentful wife yes. and mother. Oh, um, yeah. She did so, such a great job. I wanted to run off into the woods and join a coven. So uh, the ratings, Rotten Tomatoes, 90%. That's good. I agree with that. IMDb, 7 out of 10. Letterbox a 3.8 out of 5, and the average audience rating is a 3.3 out of 5. Yeah, that's people who don't understand what's going on. Yeah. That was me when I first walked out of the theater. Yeah, I, I can see that. There's, And plus, there's a lot of people that they don't really want to see this for the story. They they want to see it for what scary witch shit's going to happen, and that that's not this. I was looking up a a certain word that was used and ended up on a Reddit thread, and there one of the first things on there was somebody who said exactly what I said. They fucking hated the movie when they first seen it, and then have loved it ever since when they rewatched it and kind of understood what was going on. We've heard that quite a few times now. Uh, that seems to be a thing. So, somebody to rate this movie. After only watching it one time, especially without subtitles, I could see that. Yeah, if you would like to watch this movie, you can currently find it streaming on Max, Hulu, or Roku. Um, There's also like Amazon with a premium subscription. Didn't say what the subscription is, so good luck to that. And you can always rent it from Apple, Google, and YouTube. All right, so you ready to jump into this story? Let's do it. So we start off with a very simple white and black title card that says The Witch, A New England Folk Tale. And uh, we are here in the year 1630, so 36 years before our last movie. So this predates Sarah Fear. Uh, so this kicks off with a church full of people that seem to be holding like, like a court, kind of like a trial or some kind of court. Because you know how back then uh, church was also like the government building. These are combined at that time. And uh, we are immediately introduced to our main character, a teenage girl named Thomason. And we are shown that her father, a man named William, is standing addressing this court. And this court has three judges sitting at a desk, dressed straight up like pilgrims. Like fresh off the Mayflower, where is my musket and twine? These are the guys who built the sets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, their outfits. So, like, like William and stuff and some of the people sitting in the church are not dressed like this. But these three guys, they literally have the white and black. Like the, like the cartoon of Thanksgiving that they showed. I don't know if they do it anymore. But uh, back when we were kids, they'd, like, have stuff in schools, like, uh, when it's Thanksgiving time, they had the pilgrims with the hat and the buckle on the hat and shit. That's this is exactly what they're wearing. Two thoughts came to my mind when I seen them. That's that's a hot outfit. The well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> the first thought was thanks Thanksgiving. Yep. The killer, and then <laughs> um, um, <laughs> John Carver, <laughs> and then immediately after that, I thought of pilgrim titties. From Thanksgiving, <laughs> the first thing that jumped into my mind was, damn, pilgrim titties. You and know, that's a hot outfit. The guy in, sitting in the middle does look like John Carver. Like the mustache and the yeah. beard. Yeah, that's funny. So we don't find out exactly why William is here in this church court, but it's not good. William is basically like, I don't give a fuck what y'all say. You're not as Christian as me. I have done nothing wrong. and Y'all are posers. So. From what I can put together, William was either saying or preaching kind of a different interpretation of something in the Bible, and they were basically like, you need to stop that and admit that you were wrong. And he says, ha, I am way holier than thou, suck my dick, and then 
Suck thy dick. <laughs> Suck thy dick. And uh, they basically say, like, are you really going to let your pride get you in trouble? Like, just admit you were in the wrong, and, you know, we'll, we'll kind of squash it. And he says, you're goddamn right I am. It, it, so I rewound this part because I was really, really curious. I'd never really put a whole lot of thought into why that they were kicked out. And based off of kind of rewinding it and, and looking at the subtitles, I think it sounds like they came from England uh, because the English churches were really lax at that point. And they were, they were going to go form their own churches, and own lands. And it seems like that the church in this little town has become very lax. He's very Puritan. He's very hardcore Christian. Yeah. And he calls them fake Christians, and he says an English king's church. So obviously they're resorting more so back to the ways of the English churches that they left and and came here to get away from. And he's not having that shit. Yeah, that's kind of what I put together is basically he's saying something different than what they're saying. And they're like, yo, you can't do that. And because, you know, we're preachers. You can't make us look bad. And uh, he's like, well, you're fake ass Christian. So you should go suck a dick. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into religious or religious bashing, but you know, a lot of religions, not just Christians, but it is out there that a lot of people pick and choose what they want to follow and what parts that they think are important and what's not. And he's that guy who's like, no, all of it's important. We got to live exactly by the book. And it seems like they are kind of starting to pick and choose and, and not be as extreme. And he, instead of just sucking it up for the sake of his family, he is going to take his pride over that. And he basically tells them, fuck you guys, I'll just leave. And they're like, thank God, that'll make this so much easier. Just go. Yeah, uh, if you were to kind of shorten it up into a much more modern version, he cut off his nose to spite his face. So bite thy face. So William and his whole family get banished from the settlement, and William says, good, I'm glad, I'll go start my own shit, and it'll be better, because God likes me better anyway. And, oh, by the way, God came to me in a dream, and he told me he thinks your pilgrim outfits are lame. Uh, then we see a shot of the family and Every single thing they own <laughs> stacked on this tiny cart, leaving the settlement as the big gate closes behind them. Thomason looks stunned, and we get some ominous as fuck string music playing as they ride off into nowhere. <laughs> yeah, so I noticed in this one that uh, Thomason... Is actually the last to get up and follow the family when they walk out. She's she like hesitates. shocked. Yeah. And when they close the gates and they're riding away on the most uncomfortable carriage ride ever, uh, she is the only one looking back. So this is an early, very early shot that she does. She kind of doesn't. For one, she don't want to leave. And for two, it seems like this is maybe a little bit of foreshadowing that she's kind of the different one in her family. Yeah, I want to bring up that poor horse. He got stuck driving, dragging six human beings and all of their belongings plus the weight of the cart. And God knows how how far they went. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel bad for him. <laughs> Hope he got paid a lot for this. Yeah, I'm sure they paid him in shit tons of carrots that they couldn't farm. Uh, next, we see William and his wife, Catherine, praying in a field. They stretch their arms out to the sky with smiles on their faces and then hold hands. God has led them to their new farmland. Back when you could just say, hey, this looks nice. I now own this land. Yeah, that's wild. Uh, so we jump pretty far ahead here. Um, I'm not exactly sure. They don't really say. But uh, it has to, has to be a decent amount of time because... Now they have a few buildings on the property, and they got a whole ass baby that they didn't have before. So, I don't know, this could be like a year later. Yeah, yeah, I'm at, at least a year. Thinking thinking, probably about a two-year jump. Yeah, when, when I was trying to figure out this 
this amount of time here, I actually rewound to that scene we were just talking about where they're taking off on the cart. And I was like, did she have the baby? I don't think she had a baby when they left. And no, she does not have a baby. And she doesn't really look pregnant, but it's hard to tell because she has a big old wool dress on. So, yeah. And uh, for somebody who is experienced in babies, that is a large baby. That is not a newborn baby. That baby's like probably nine months to a year old. Oh, man. So, yeah, this this is probably like a year and a half or something later. Yeah. This, this, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's why I thought about two years. Uh, so they also have some animals, a few goats, some chickens, a dog, and some corn crops. So they're doing pretty good. Uh, so after Thomason does her morning prayer, her mother Catherine, who is busy tending to the garden, has her take the baby, who is named Samuel, and go watch him somewhere. So she takes him over uh, to like the side of the property. It's kind of about 100 feet away from the wood line. She lays him on a blanket in the grass and plays peekaboo with him. She's pretty much doing that thing where you, uh, you know, you put your hands uh, over your face and then you quickly remove them and say boo. I don't know why babies like that shit so much, but the baby's digging it. Babies fucking love it. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, your face disappeared. Your face is back. It's gone again. Like, yeah, it's, it's weird. Um. So we see her do this about two or three times until she does it again, but instantly has a look of shock on her face. The camera pans down and all that is left is Samuel's blanket. Thomason then looks up and sees some small trees on the wood line moving as if someone just ran through them. So something that is unbelievably fast and quiet has snuck up and snatched this fucking baby. We then see a cloaked person running through thick woods with Samuel in their arms. And then we get shots of a naked Sam lying on a blanket as an old lady rubs her or rubs his body with her old wrinkly ass hands. Gross ass hand. And then we get a quick glimpse of a knife. The screen goes black for a moment. Then we see a naked old hag lady grinding and mixing something up in her witch's hut. Now, hold on tight, because this one's a bit rough. We see that she has grinded baby Samuel up into a bloody paste or goo. And she is smearing him all over herself and her broomstick as she lays on the floor of her dark-ass hut. And if you watch really closely, you get a very quick glimpse of her start to float. Yeah. Like right before that scene ends. It's another uh, creepy old naked lady in horror. And it always yeah. goes well. Every time we've yeah. never realized how often that was until we started doing this show, it is a common thing in horror to have naked old ladies, and it's always creepy. Every time. Every time. This was actually an interesting theory that uh, I've seen, is that this didn't actually happen. This is a dream that Tomlinson is having because she's woke up. She's having a bad dream right after this. And, uh, you know, her brother tells her, you know, go back to sleep. It's going to be okay. And the reason that is the a theory, it's because the knife that she grabs to kill the baby is the same knife that they have in the house that they bloodlet later on with. And that is actually would be um, interesting because that would be the witch is already having a influence over her dreams. Uh, well, so that stuff is is done on purpose and we will we'll talk about that kind of stuff later. But uh I th- I think that it's made really vague on uh, purpose. This whole this whole story is very vague yeah. on purpose. Uh so we then get a weird unfocused shot of the sky and moon at night with an old lady shaped figure rising in the air. So here's the deal. In real life Way back in the day, between the 15 and 1700s, it was widely believed that witches would steal children, and using a combination of herbs, tonics, and the child's blood or flesh would make a kind of lotion 
to rub on themselves in order to be able to fly. Yes, real human beings actually believed that. Well, we have human beings now that think you take, like, the adrenaline glands out of children and shoot them in yourself to make yourself young. So that, it's not that far off. Yeah, in a hundred years, they'll be talking about that. Yeah. Yes, they um, will. So that is, that is what this scene is depicting here. Basically, she steals the baby, she grinds him up into this goo, she rubs it all over herself, and it gives her the ability to fly. And I think a really good question is I wonder how much flight time you get per baby. Like, how many miles per child? Well, I actually think that being a witch, uh, you, you probably only need one or two babies a year to keep your flying. Like, I don't think it's like a, you run out of gas. I think it's as long as you, as long as you sacrifice and bathe yourself and grind a baby at least once or twice a year, you can fly whenever you want. <laughs> so a few mornings later, Thomason's younger brother named Caleb, who is about 13, is getting ready for the day, and he decides to stop and check out his older sister's breasts as she sleeps. We also see Catherine in the background wailing still from the loss of baby Samuel. Caleb joins William out by the corn. William tells him that they can search no more for baby Samuel. William believes that a wolf must have gotten him and he is most certainly dead. We also see that William corn has become infected with some kind of disease and is no longer usable. William then invites Caleb to go out in the woods with him to hunt for food. He informs him that he has been setting traps out there for some time now, and he says something a little important here. He says, we will conquer this wilderness. It will not consume us. This line, amongst other stuff, will become a lot more important later. So out in the woods... William and Caleb talk about how they are all sinners. And you're even a sinner when you were first born because the first man ever, Adam, sinned and it's pretty much passed on to you. Seems kind of unfair, but... You know, that's wild to me. Like, your great-great-grandfather ate an apple and now you're, you know, you're, you're paying the price for that. Like, everybody's paying the price for this one guy's decision. Yeah, that sounds a little out there, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I almost wondered, like, does it really say that? Or is that just some shit they came up with? You know, what what saddens me about this scene is how fucking petrified this child is that he is going to die and go to hell. That was my next sentence. Is That's really stressful to a kid to know yes, that. That is, that very thought uh, drives a lot of people from their religion. So Caleb asked that because they got kicked out of the settlement before Samuel was born and he wasn't able to be baptized. Then the question is, did baby Samuel go to hell? William tells him that they have been praying for him, but that's all they can really do. And in a roundabout way, he tells him that he doesn't really know and that only God really knows. We also learn that William sucks at setting traps. And when Caleb asked him where he got the traps from, he tells him that he took his wife's special silver cup and traded it for these traps. Caleb's like, oh shit. Because, you know, these are, these are like super religious people. So just something as simple as like taking an item from another family member and selling it, that's like a big deal. It's a huge deal. That's a huge deal now when you take something of your wife's that's like... Very important to them, and then selling it without them knowing, that's still a huge deal. Yeah. I thought it was hilarious that he says, don't tell your mother about the cup. Like, that's so, so realistic. Yeah, but, you know, it's a big deal to us because of the situation. Like, we don't want to hurt that person's feelings, or we don't want to do something to, bad to somebody that's important to us. But they have that, but then they also have this this looming thing of... God's going to punish them for this. Like that everything they do has that looming threat over top. It's got to be exhausting. What part of the 10 commandments uh disobeys you from selling a cup? 
Well, he stole, so there's like thou shalt not is steal. Is it stealing though? It's his. Mm. I mean, it is his his cup too. <laughs> I mean, this is Christianity. Let's be real. Everything in that house is his. Yeah, this is true. That why he could have sold his wife, and it would have been okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so William tells him like, Hey, don't, don't tell your mother. I will tell your mother when the time is right. Uh, so while walking back, the dog Fowler begins to bark at a rabbit. William and Caleb ready the gigantically long rifle in order to shoot it. William also sucks with a gun. You see, you see him fiddling around with it. He doesn't seem like he's very familiar with this gun. And uh, when he finally gets it figured out, he aims the gun at the rabbit, and the rabbit just kind of watches this fool like he he knows he sucks at this. And William pulls the trigger, and the black powder blows up in his face. And the rabbit's like, you suck, and it leaves. So back at the farm, we see that Thomason is doing farm work while her twin younger brother and sister run around and sing songs about the goat Black Philip. This is really our first time seeing the twins, and they do not listen or have really any respect for Thomason at all. And because of this, it is pretty obvious that Thomason does not care for them either. So this is not really a good sibling relationship. No, they suck. They do suck. The twins suck. The twins are assholes. As William and Caleb return to the farm, Catherine is pissed. She's basically like, how could you just leave for hours and not tell me where you were going? And she is also upset that they went into the woods. Um, I haven't mentioned it yet, but uh, the family has like a ban on going into the woods. Like nobody goes into the woods. They don't say why, but uh, I don't know. Maybe they're worried about animal like a wolf or something getting you but yeah no one's allowed to go in the woods i guess no one can tell william he can't go in the woods because you know he runs shit here but Uh, they probably have that rule for their kids i mean you gotta think back then you got kids somebody gets lost in the woods there's no search party there's no phones gps that's that's pretty much it you get lost in the woods you're done Uh, But then Caleb comes up with a lie to calm his mother down. He tells her that he thought he'd seen an apple tree down in the valley and asked his father to accompany him down there in order to get Catherine an apple to hopefully cheer her up. This lie, of course, works, and she thanks Caleb for the effort, but then immediately starts chewing out Thomason over the twins letting Black Philip out. Yeah, it's very clear that Catherine has some serious resentment against Tomlinson. Oh, yeah. And she plays this character so good, too. She's got that, like, everything that goes wrong is Tomlinson's fault. Yeah, and it just builds. It's like, yeah. it's it's this um, this anger towards somebody that just gets bigger and bigger. And what's the perfect way in the 1600s to blame all your problems on somebody else? Witchcraft. Yes. That was a way that people could literally blame anything. Bad weather, you know, bad crops for the year, your house burns down, your nail breaks. It's all witchcraft. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the few things where you don't have to have any proof. You just have to have an accusation. You also don't have to have any self-accountability. I think that was a big part of it in real life back then. Is people, when bad things happen, they didn't think, what what is the shit the bad shit I did that caused this? It's much easier to say, oh, this isn't my fault. I'm doing things right. This is this is witchcraft. This is this other person's fault. So after uh, William's failure with the crops this morning, the trapping and hunting in the woods, and now his son coming up with a better lie to chill Catherine out, he goes to chop some wood, and this becomes a running theme and important at the end so they purposely made him look like jesus here did you notice that no i thought everybody looked like jesus back then so yeah when he when the when he does the first time when he's chopping the wood um you remember like you know thomason takes his clothes that he got dirty when um when the fucking goat knocked him over which by the way was not planned that goat was the worst fucking thing on set 
and the guy who played William battled that fucking goat because that goat would literally buck at him and hit him, and the goat was an asshole. There was actually supposed to be way more scenes with Black Phillip, but he was so fucking untrained, like they couldn't hardly train him, and he was such a dick that they were like, just use what we have. Fuck him. The goat is Satan. Yeah. That's why, in real life. But yeah, so anyway, Thomason takes his like muddy clothes. She's supposed to go wash him, and he's got like just that sheet around him, and he has no shirt on when he's chopping the wood. Yeah, so he's supposed to kind of look like Jesus. And um, the reason why they did that is so he got kicked out of the settlement because he believed that he was a better Christian and knew more than the three people in charge there. So in his eyes, he himself is closer to Jesus than, say, you know, the average person. But so far from what we have seen, he is very prideful, he has lied, and he has even stolen. So he believes that he is this like pure man of God, but his actions say something completely different. Yeah, I got a, I got a whole thing about that here at the end. Well, yeah, I think, so, you know, without jumping too much about what I discovered about the movie that I'm going to talk about later, but um, hit this, this with him is one of the founding blocks of this story. Yeah, William's pride definitely is what causes everything. That oh, happens. it's, yeah, it's absolutely and there's, the we'll, whole cause of this. We'll go over it more at the end, but there's uh, plenty examples of why that is. So Thomason is down at the brook washing some clothes when Caleb arrives to fill a bucket. And again, he stares at his sister's chest. They start chatting, and we do see that, unlike the relationship with the twins, Thomason and Caleb are close, and they do try to stick together. Thomason actually caught him. Oh, yeah. Second. So I looked up the word dallying, because that's what she says. So it is uh, to dally or dallying, to waste time, loiter, delay, to act playfully, especially in a flirtatious way. So she called him out. Yeah. Head on. Like, are you wasting time playing around? Like, uh, basically telling him, hey, I caught you looking at my titties. Yeah, I think she just has to, that's kind of, it's not as big of a deal as it is now because I think back then the mindset was, well, men are going to, men are going to look like, well, he, that's he's, just what it is. He's still a kid and she knows he's, he's starting, uh, starting puberty. That's probably funny to her. How clearly is in the movie. She doesn't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, but his family also did take him away from every other female he ever knew in his life. Uh, yeah, so while they're down there, the twins sneak up on them in the brush, and the young girl, uh, Mercy, yells, I be the wicked witch of the wood. And she starts to act out being a witch. I don't know what's up with that clackety-clackety thing. Do witches make a clackety-clackety noise? Don't you know witches be clacking... Clacking all over the woods, man. That's that's a mm. thing. Clackety clack clack, bitch. Uh, so Thomason's like, get the fuck out of here. Uh, Mercy then tells her that their mother hates her, and that Black Philip says that she can do whatever she likes. Thomason attempts to send her back to the farm, and this little shithead calls her out for letting the witch take Sam. And an eagle-eyed viewer might wonder. How does this child know that? Mm-hmm. And even, th even the stuff about her mom hating her. Yeah. Like, how would a kid that young pick up on that? Uh, and this kind of sets Thomason off, but she doesn't freak out. She plays it pretty smooth. She tells Mercy that she's right. It was a witch that took Sam. It was her that took him because she's the wicked witch of the wood. Mercy doesn't like this and tries to call Thomason a liar, and Thomason continues by telling her that at night, her spirit slips away from her body and dances naked with the devil. Don't we, don't we all do that? That's, I thought that everybody did that. Mm, only on full moons for me, but... Uh... She then says that she can make anyone vanish that she wants. She may just take Mercy to the devil. And then she tells her about how she craves to sink her teeth 
into Mercy's pink flesh. This scares Mercy, and Thomason makes her swear she won't tell their mother and father, and she lets her go, and Mercy runs off back to the farm. When she talked about the uh, sinking her teeth into her flesh, I was like, damn, th- this is this is going far. <laughs> well, uh, the going far moment for me is when she said, yeah, I took the baby that was, uh, I think she, I, I forgot the exact word she uses, but she basically is like, yeah, I, I gave the witch to, to, to the what, devil. What, what's, what's their, but Samuel, I gave Sam to the, to the witch to take to the devil. And I was like, man, that, that's a little extreme. You know, that is your sibling that went missing that you now know is dead. It's, it, Whatever got it's dead. It's not a baby out there living in the wilderness. To make that comment, I thought that was a little far. Like, yeah, I did. I did kill our brother. I took him out into the woods for the witch to eat him. Like, whoa. And for a first time viewer, at least for me, when I first seen this movie, I had the question, did she make a deal with the devil? Is that what this movie is going to be about? So later on, while the whole family is eating dinner together, Catherine asks Thomason about the silver cup. Thomason names off a couple places it could be, but Catherine says that she has looked all over for it and hasn't seen it in a long time. So for context, she's not asking her like, hey, have you seen my silver cup? No, she's like accusing her of stealing or losing the cup. So Thomason's like, no, I don't know where the cup is. Please just let me eat my plate of stale bread. Caleb's sitting over there like, oh shit, because he knows what's going on. And William's over there trying to hide behind his fucking napkin. I will give him a tiny bit of credit. He he does interrupt her to kind of take up a little bit for Thomason. But unfortunately, Catherine's wrath is too much. He kind of backs down. Well, you know, he took the cup. He knows he took the cup. And he is right now letting his daughter take the brunt of oh, that. Oh, yeah. He's definitely and wrong. I think this is a very important part of the movie. We'll, we'll mention later on. But, yeah, this is a very key part. He, he, he does not take up at all for his daughter and tell the truth of what, what actually happened. Yeah, so uh, she drops the most fucked up line of the movie so far. Thomason says again that she hasn't touched it when Catherine cuts her off and said, did the wolf vanish that too? Damn. That's a mic drop. That is, that was rough. That's fucking cold. Boom, you're roasted. That's cold. So later when everyone is in bed, we see a conversation between William and Catherine and he tells her that she's taking the loss of Sam a little too hard. And I was like, what? It's been a week. What you know of your your baby was eaten by a wolf, and, sh- and you know she's you're gonna tell the mom like, hey, you're taking this a little too hard. Yeah, like, uh, but this this was the 1600s, and people who had this many kids like have normally lost a child. Like he makes the point we have we hadn't lost any of our kids. He tries to turn that into God's blessed us so much. He's so great. You know, he took this one, but we haven't lost any of our kids. Uh, but that was a lot more common back then. Babies babies didn't make it all the time back then. Yeah, I feel like I, you I, sh- shouldn't, I agree. You shouldn't I agree. tell your wife like a week later, like, you need to get over this. It's because William's over it. Well, he's like, uh, <laughs> this is God's will thing. Yep. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, so. He follows that up with, uh, hey, we're really lucky we made it this long before God took one of our children. Uh, Basically, you know, as I see it, we're still in the green. Stocks are up. Yeah, we're still good. We've only lost one. Uh, But Catherine sees it very differently, and she tells him that he has cursed the family. And William definitely disagrees. He comes up with this bullshit way to make it seem like God favors them so much that he is giving them this test just so he could show them even more of his grace. And I'm like, bro, you're brainwashing yourself. You're literally like brainwashing yourself. Like 
you're coming up with these really intricate ways that like God is fucking you over because he loves you so much and you, but you can explain it to yourself as a good thing. Like okay. and This is a very real thing. <laughs> oh yeah. People do this all the time. Yeah. This is this, this guy's he, he's deep in it. So Catherine says that they should have never left the settlement. Williams like, fuck that and fuck those people. But then Catherine brings up that Thomason has now reached womanhood and it is time to give her away to serve another family. Time to get her out of my fucking house. Yep. And then it is shown that Thomason and Caleb are awake and listening to this whole conversation. Catherine then goes off about how Samuel wasn't baptized and now he is in hell. The corn is ruined and now they are going to starve to death. After William calms her down for a bit, he then tells her that he will take Thomason and the horse to the settlement tomorrow and give her to a good family. So I did find in my research that this was actually fairly common. Uh, pretty much just uh, sell your daughter away to some rich people so she can work seven days a week until hopefully somebody fucking wanted to marry her and they would just like pay the rich family, they would just buy her from the rich family and then marry her. This is very common in the Puritan uh, people. Yeah, they're like, she can she can fuck now. Um, somebody will take her and yeah. use her as a slave and have sex with her until somebody wants to marry her. Yeah, uh, this is horrible uh, that, that Tomlinson and Caleb are, are awake listening to this whole conversation. And this uh, leads to Caleb trying to save his sister, which is leads us to the next part. Uh, so next we see Caleb wake up at the ass crack of dawn, get dressed, and begin getting the horse ready. Thomason surprises him and tells uh, he and he tells her that he has a plan, and if it works out, she won't have to be given away. So she makes a deal that she won't wake their parents if he allows her to go with him. A little later on, we see Thomason is riding the horse while Fowler and Caleb walk beside them, carrying the giant rifle that is way bigger than him. As they walk through the woods, uh, reminiscing about their lives in England, Fowler spots the rabbit again. This causes the horse to freak out. Fowler then chases the rabbit and Caleb runs behind them. The horse, now very upset, begins to buck and throws Thomason off, knocking her unconscious. Next up, it is now on the verge of night. William and Catherine are very worried and we see that Caleb is lost somewhere deep in the forest alone. While trying to find his way back, he hears Fowler cry in pain and when he finds him, it's pretty sad. The dog is basically has like his guts ripped out and he is slowly dying. Not even dead yet. I hated this scene. They have no comment on that. Poor, poor dog. Uh, Thomason uh, awakes all alone in the woods as well, but she can actually hear William's voice yelling for them. She sets off in that direction where she eventually finds him and tells him that Caleb is lost. Caleb attempts to find his way back, but just seems to get deeper and deeper into the woods. And sees this rabbit again. And this rabbit is definitely uh, not a regular rabbit. Uh, this is either the witch or uh, the witch is making them see this rabbit, which would explain why William got his eye shot out when he tried to shoot it and why it every time it shows up, some bad shit happens. So after climbing through some thick brush, he comes across a hut in the woods. He slowly walks towards it when he then sees a very beautiful young witch step out of the door to welcome him. Man, she would have fucking lured me into. I j literally was my next sentence was I would have been mes mesmerized because she is fine. Yeah, I would have been fucking witches too for sure. So I probably wouldn't have been too upset about it either. She slowly walks over to him, smiles, and leans down to kiss him. And as their li lips touch, we then see an old lady arm grab the back of his head as he struggles to get away. So, quick story, the actor, who was 13 at the time, had never kissed a girl before this and was very, very nervous about filming this scene. And after it was done, 
he was feeling pretty good about himself. Oh, I bet he yeah, fucking yeah. was. Yeah, that came from the director. He was like, oh, yeah, he was like strutting around set. Then he's a badass now. <laughs> yeah, what a what a great first kiss. I mean, other than that, she's an adult and he's like 13. But that aside, for him, that's great. She was a uh, very easy to look at. Yeah, I I hate how they lived back then, but I loved like the corsets with like the with like the hooded cape and the you know the just hot witch look back then. Oh yeah, I'm about that. I don't think the hot. I don't think the goth girls were very common back then. I think it, we just see that in in movies with witch witches. They did have the cleavage there. They did squeeze into. Uh, they did break ribs. Yeah, squeezing into corsets and. Pushing their boobs together. Yeah, as long as she stays in disguise, I don't care if she's old and gross. It's all about what you see, right? Perception is reality. So back at the farm, uh, Catherine is, of course, interrogating Thomason about Caleb. William says that he will go search at dawn, but his wife wants him to go to the settlement and get help. I'm sure he loves that idea. Catherine then goes back to yelling at Thomason, and this is when William finally tells his wife he took the silver cup. He also tells her that uh, the looking for apples story was a lie and that he took Caleb out to the woods to hunt. Uh, They then go outside where Catherine rips into him. She tells him that she knew he was false and it is his fault that they lost another child and he has damned the family to hell. She then slaps the shit out of him in front of the children. That's uh, probably something you don't do back then. Oh, no. She got off easy. Oh, Put yeah. Like that. So after things have settled down a bit, Thomason goes outside to put the goats up when she finds a stumbling naked Caleb by the fence. They quickly bring him inside where he lays unconscious, and we see that he has uh, like bite marks on his mouth from the witch's kiss. And while Catherine and Thomason attend to Caleb... William then heads outside in the dark of night in pouring rain to chop more wood. The next day, Thomason is milking the goats and the twins are playing with Black Philip again. So Mercy and Jonas tell Thomason that Black Philip told them that she was wicked and that she put the devil in Caleb when they were out in the woods. And that is why he is sick. She kind of had it with uh, their bullshit at this point. And goes back to milking the goat. But when she pulls on the goat's teat. Blood runs into the pan. Not yeah. milk. She is clearly freaked the fuck out. Oh yeah. Which would make you think if she was a witch. And was causing all this. And she had made some type of deal. That she wouldn't be so freaked out by this. So Catherine and William are upstairs with Caleb. When Catherine says. This is fucking witchcraft. So here we go. He has been uh, kind of cursed somehow. They've, She says something about like they've kind of seen it before and it looks the exact same way. So she's like, I know this shit's witchcraft. William doesn't really believe it though and he plans on going to the settlement in the morning, taking Thomason to it. He's still, he's still taking her to another family. We're getting rid of that bitch still. It doesn't matter. And uh, having a doctor look at Caleb. How's he going to get Ca- there? Catherine is not happy with anything. I feel like anything William says, Catherine's just going to have a problem with it. Like, she throws a fit about this plan. He's getting rid of his daughter that he doesn't want to because she hates her. She's taking his son to go get help because he's sick and dying, and they don't know what's wrong with them. And she's still like, no, fuck that. You're not leaving me here. So Catherine ends up breaking down and explains to William that ever since Sam disappeared, she has mostly lost her faith and her heart has turned to stone. Later on, the whole family is working on shucking some corn for trade at the settlement when they all suddenly hear Caleb scream. They all rush to be by his side where he is still unconscious but keeps saying, get the narrow axe and cut off her head. He then suddenly awakens and starts screaming in pain, yelling that the witch is hurting him. He passes back out and they notice that his mouth is locked shut. 
William begins to pry his jaws open and we see blood begin to run from his lips. William then finally gets Caleb's mouth to open. Caleb leans forward and we slowly see a motherfucking bloody apple exit his mouth and fall to the floor. So did you notice that the apple has a bite taken out of it? Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of hinting there that he, when he kissed the witch, he he, uh, took a bite of the forbidden fruit. I think that's some uh, reference there. Yes, this apple is a lot more important than I think people tend to notice. So Catherine is immediately like, I told you so. He is witched. I knew it. I called it. The twins then run from Thomason yelling, uh, or run from Thomason telling their parents that Thomason is the witch. William at first tries to tell them that this is bullshit, but the twins tell them about the blood from the goat titty and how she said she signed the devil's book. Thomason attempts to explain that she was just trying to scare them, but it is too late. The damage has already been done. That's why you don't joke about shit when you live in a culture that could literally kill you just because someone thinks something's true. Like, it must have been difficult back then <laughs> to have any kind of humor because of the way people take just take shit. Yeah, fuck these twins. Yep. They're bastards. William questions Thomason about her love and devotion to God, and he then demands everyone to gather around Caleb and pray. The twins are both holding their stomachs in pain, and Catherine notices that the twins aren't praying. Jonas and Mercy then admit that they suddenly cannot remember the prayer, and this greatly concerns William and Catherine. So we'll have a little history lesson here. During the witch hunts of the colonial American, it was widely believed that a witch or someone who had been bewitched by witchcraft would not be able to say the entire Lord's Prayer. This became a common technique to use during accusations, trials, and even professional witch hunting. So that is why the look on their two faces is like, oh shit, because now they're like, the twins are now being bewitched. Like, they're they're now being cursed. Yeah, you would think that they would think, well, Tomlinson didn't have a problem with her prayers, so maybe it's the twins. But no. No, no they just, still hate her. Yeah. So a very concerned William and Catherine attempt to walk the children through the prayer. They don't get very far. By about the second sentence, the twins are doubled over in pain and yelling, stop it. Thomason attempts to make them stop because she suspects that they are full of shit and her, her pretty much her ass is on the line here. She knows it. This just makes things worse because the twins then scream, fall to the floor, and are now unconscious. Caleb then suddenly awakens. He is thrashing in pain and saying how the witch wants his blood. He yells that Satan himself is upon him and he begins to scream for the help of God. William, Catherine, and Thomason are straight up shook by this shit. Like the look on their face. They're like, damn, dude, Satan, like Satan himself is here. Yeah. You know, William's probably like, well, you know, it's because I'm so damn fucking Christ like. Yeah. No wonder he's here. It, he really wants the, me. The devil came to fight me himself. Yeah. I am, I am Jesus too. I am Jesus' son. I'm Jesus the <laughs> second. Jesus had a secret son, and it was me. <laughs> My mom was a virgin. I, uh, I just got just got to put that out. They there. didn't. They didn't fuck. He just, you know, touched her on the shoulder, impregnated me, impregnated her with me. Uh, and after a moment of shock, they begin to pray with Caleb, and then suddenly everything just stops. Caleb comes to, he looks at his mother and father with a relieved look on his face. Everything's great. Yay. They saved him with some prayer. He then starts reciting this like love letter dialogue to Christ. Like bathe me in thy blood, shower me with kisses of your salvation. I feel like this is taken from the Bible. Uh, I will tell you where it comes from. It's not from the Bible, but, uh, I was like, this is a lot. 
Yeah. This is a lot. This kid's this kid sent it deep too. This is what you would write like the person that you were in love with. Like some of the stuff you would say to like if your lover was in another place and you had to write them letters. Like it's like, it's, it's a little much. Jesus bathe me with your kisses unzip my pants and fondle my nuts in your hand. <laughs> He's all holy fondling of my nuts. So he sits up and welcomes God's grace and begins to what I can only describe as a joker laugh. He, he then lays back down on the bedding and kind of uh, does this like pure ecstasy orgasmic reaction. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this kid just came on himself. If I were to sum it up, I would say he spiritually ejaculated. I think Jesus fondled the nuts really good. If you had a black light that had been blessed by a priest, what you would find in that room? <laughs> <laughs> fucking, fucking spirit come everywhere. <laughs> But yeah, that's what's going on here is it is it is like after sex glow times 10. Like it is uh, a lot. I, I don't keep saying it's a lot, but this whole thing is a lot. Yeah, it's uh, enough to make any uh, any priest really excited. <laughs> so while Caleb is enjoying the afterglow of his religious experience, he dies. His face he, just goes blank. Jesus fondled his balls to death. He come the life right out of himself spiritually. Mm -hmm. Um. All right. So we're gonna talk about this scene because this scene, a uh, very big scene. For one, the director talked about this scene being kind of the scene they all dreaded, that they knew was coming. Everyone dreaded it, and the reason why is because. There is a lot of dialogue where everyone's yelling over each other. And it's really hard to keep track of making sure all the actors are hitting their lines when you have fucking five people yelling over each other. Um, but another thing is they shot that whole scene with Caleb as he does this big, long, weird speech and then his ecstasy moment and then his death. That was all one take. And they were worried, like, you know, this this 13-year-old kid going to nail this? But he does. Did, did he get it first try? I don't know if he did it first try. That, mm. I didn't hear about that, but... That's a lot to remember. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about what he said. So the weird prayer monologue thing that Caleb recites right before his death, uh, the kiss me with kisses of his mouth for his love is sweeter than wine, like all that stuff. Um, this is actually a prayer from John Winthrop, who is one of the main Puritan founders of New England. Uh, that particular line itself is from a song of Solomon. And Winthrop also used that um, line in this prayer. So this whole long thing that he says is something that somebody actually wrote. Somebody important actually wrote. Hmm. Uh, yeah, and also the whole scene with Caleb and the reactions of the twins. Um, this whole entire thing, everything you see in this scene that everyone's doing, that everyone's saying, was all based on real journal entries from religious figures who would typically be called in to help the like a person that was like bewitched, kind of like possessed. You know, they were almost like a possession and an exorcist. So basically, like after this, like the priest would go there to try to help them, and then this crazy shit would happen, and they would say all this crazy shit, and then the priest would kind of write it down of what happened, and then um, they would hang them and set them on fire. Uh, I, it depends because also a lot of this stuff also like came from recorded documents and official trial records from the Salem witch trials. Hmm. Which they hung. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like there was events that basically what Caleb did happened in court. Well, who decides like, well, your, your, your prayers didn't get enough of the witch out of them. We got to hang them. 
Or do they hang him anyway, and they're just like, well, we're going to try to free him of the witch before we hang him. Yeah, I mean, it's... Because it most, most of these women that were hung were denying witchcraft, as it is. So, I mean, who, where do you... It's not like a exorcism where you're like, okay, well, he's not acting fucking possessed anymore. So here's the crazy thing is... You know, especially with the Salem witch trials, as we it was it was eventually admitted that this was all made up, and it just it became this um, this mass hysteria amongst this place of all these people that lived here. And now, when you think about that happening in a courtroom, you now know that this is this is somebody that has gotten so involved in this. This isn't real. You know what they're saying and it's like, oh, I'm in pain and I'm getting stabbed. Like, this is all, sh- this is all for show. And it's so weird. Like, do they, did they really, did they really believe that this was happening because of this mass hysteria that was happening? Or were they just like, I want to put on this, sh- I just want to put on this show and make it, I don't know. I, I mean, I want to see somebody die. Yeah. Maybe once um, they got so far into it, they couldn't get out of it. Yeah, that, I think another uh, another part of it goes back to uh, people using witchcraft to not take accountability of their own shit that they've done. You, like I said, when things are going bad, when the town has a drought and there's no food and everybody's hungry, instead of looking at the bad shit that you've done in your life, it's a lot easier to say, "No, it's this witch's fault. She did it." What's kill her? Yeah, and witchcraft uh, was also at that time used as a weapon. You know, if you had, uh, say you had a business and another guy in the town had a business and his, you, you both did the same thing and his business was doing better than yours, you could very easily just say, hey, I seen him fucking doing witchcraft in the woods. And boom, your, your competition is eliminated. Uh, it was used a lot for that kind of stuff too. But it's just mind blowing that when you watch this scene with these people that are that that are so devoted to this and believe that this is so real, it's crazy. It's mind blowing. Well, they killed people. I know. They literally killed kids. Over they a, killed kids over this shit. Over a hundred and fifty men and women in Salem alone. It's crazy. Yeah. Scary. And a lot of this, especially like this stuff in this scene was taken from court documents and transcripts from Salem itself. It, it, it's scary, the mass hysteria and the mob mentality that happens within people. And it happens in places in the, in the world today mm-hmm. still. Uh, and it, it is scary to see what people are capable of. And when people get so into a certain thing, whether that's religion or politics or whatever it is, that they are willing to murder people. So Caleb is now dead, and Catherine just loses it. Uh, The twins are over in the corner, like passed out, possessed on the floor. Thomason moves towards Caleb's body, and Catherine freaks out on her and basically tells her to get the fuck out. William chases after Thomason and attempts to console her. He's like, yeah, uh, come spring, we'll plant some wheat over here and we can finish up the barn. Uh, But tomorrow, I got to go tell the church about you being a witch. It's like he just just drops that line on her. It's like he wanted to pretend for a second that what just happened didn't happen. Well, he, he, he had, well, I'll talk about it here in a second, but he has this idea of what what is going to happen um so she's like you know i told you motherfuckers like i'm not a witch and william's like dude i just seen you do witch stuff with my own eyes like don't try to gaslight thee thomason also sam disappeared with you caleb disappeared with you you found caleb by yourself and you put the twins in a goddamn coma in front of me. Yep, and this is where uh, Tomlinson tells William what the fuck it's up, finally. Uh, but I guess in Puritan standards, 
he is being pretty lenient here because he does tell her, whatever deal you made with the devil, we can fix it. Your soul belongs to God and we just got to take you to the church and get thee fixed. That, so that, that's the mindset he has of, you know, just admit that you've made the deal with the devil, but your soul always belongs to God. So we can just take you to some, some priests and they'll do some prayers and we'll get you fixed up. And then you come back here and we'll plant some fucking wheat and you can help me work on the barn because your fucking brother's dead. And I, I got to have somebody to hand me the nails and the hammers, you know? Yeah, he has he has this unrealistic idea of what is going to happen if she just admits it. Well, this is also uh, in real life. I think that this led the same mindset led to a lot of false confessions. You know, you're telling a teenage girl, uh, you know, you're going to be hanged and killed for witchcraft. But if you just admit what you did and we can we can fix it and we can pray it out. It probably led to some girls admitting, knowing that they hadn't practiced witchcraft, to admitting a false confession. Yeah, the same exact strategy, the same thing happens today with the police. With the, yep, yep, homicide detectives and shit do this shit all the fucking time. You just tell us, you can go home, it'll all be fine, we'll make this go away. If you tell us, we'll help you. Well, the police don't, they don't have any say so over what a prosecutor does. They literally can't do shit, but either say you did it or you didn't do it. That's all they can do. But you, you know, you watch those videos and they do the same exact thing of just, you'll feel better. We'll make this okay. Like we can, you can move on with your life. And it's like, that's no, none of that is going to happen. No. <laughs> and how many people have, Later on, when DNA came out, been acquitted on false confessions because they were told these things and they admitted to them, although knowing they didn't do it, and they were sentenced to death or for life, and then DNA came out and ended up clearing a lot of people. Yeah, it's just wild, though, that, you know, a very similar thing that went on back then, and we've seen how it went back then, it's not being used nowhere near as much uh, now, but it's it's still a thing. It's still absolutely happening. But uh, he says, um, we can't do that if you don't first speak the truth about what you did. And Thomason has had it with this shit. And she's like, speak the truth? Okay. She then proceeds to call out William on all his bullshit and failures. She's like, Y'all motherfuckers were going to sell me off. You stole the silver cup and let me take the blame for it. And William's like, hold thy tongue, bitch. You can't call me out. I'm your father. It's probably like a sin or or illegal or something. (laughs) You can't can't call your dad out on being a loser. She calls him out on a bunch of shit, a bunch more shit. Uh, And then she's like, oh, yeah, you're a fucking hypocrite. You let your wife be your master, you can't grow crops, and you suck at hunting. You aren't good at shit but cutting wood. And he took Caleb out in the woods and let her take a fall on that too. Damn. Yeah, I am so I was so happy when she let him fucking have it. William is pissed and then Thomason tells him, It's not me causing this. Go talk to the twins because they made this bullshit up and they spend all day talking to Black Phillip. Uh, Then she has to kind of spell it out for him because he's still like, what? The fucking black goat that you hate is the devil. William kind of thinks about this for a moment and then he grabs Thomason and he takes her to Catherine and he tells her to tell her mother what she just told him. So Thomason tells her that Black Philip is the devil and that the twins have been making a coven with him for some time now. And William, he's on board with this. So he walks over to the sleeping twins and basically says, get me my bill hook so I can bash Jonah's skull. You know, you know why William was so in on this? 
He's like, I fucking hate that yeah. goat. <laughs> I fucking hate that goddamn black goat. It is the devil. How did I not yeah. see this? Should have known when I, it fucking tripped me up. It's a goddamn goat. So the twins reveal that they have been faking it. Little bastards. Thomason's like, I see, I told you, you know, they were fucking pretending to be fucking bewitched and in this fucking comatose state or whatever the fuck they were doing. But William has had it with all this bullshit and he puts Thomason and the twins in with the uh with the goat in the goat shed and nails the fucking door shut. This is really fucked up. He put Thomason in there with them. Uh, he's like completely on board with what she's saying. He catches the twins faking their sleep, uh their comatose state that they were in, like which proves her theory even more. And he's still like, fuck it, your mother doesn't like you. I'm putting you in here, too. I think he just does it because, you know... She called them out? No, I think it's just like, he he does believe her, but I don't think he fully believes her. You know, he's just like, you know what? All of you guys are, in, like, one of y'all is involved in something, so I'm going to lock all y'all motherfuckers up until I can get some sleep and I can figure this out tomorrow because I don't think he wants to deal with any more of it right now. Like, I got wood to chop. Yeah. Uh, later that night, after burying Caleb, we see that, once again, William is chopping wood, and he finally breaks down and admits that this whole thing is his fault and he now realizes that he is infected with pride. He tells God to dispose of him however he sees fit, but please spare his children. So after this, we jump on over to later that night, and we see Catherine get up out of bed, and across the room, uh, she sees Caleb holding baby Samuel in a blanket. Catherine is very excited to see them, and she takes Samuel into her arms. Then outside, we see that the twins are sitting next to Black Philip in the shed. We hear a loud thump on the roof, which begins to panic the twins. Back inside, Catherine is nursing baby Sam while Caleb is speaking to her, and he asks her if she would like to see them often. And she's like, of course. And then he says, well, I have brought a book for you, mother. Let's look at it together. Uh, back in the shed, a very scared set of twins see an old naked woman milking the other goat. They slowly approach her, and when she suddenly turns around and lets out a creepy, loud, jolly laugh. It was, that, that it was, was... It was very, it was, very creepy. I'm, this is, this is like, this movie doesn't have a lot of, like, instant creepy, scary things. They're all, like, like build up and stuff, Unsettled. but this was one of them. Yeah. yeah, this was one of them, because I wasn't expecting that. Uh, we then see Thomason wake up screaming. She looks over at the twins. We hear some uh, unpleasant noises, and Thomason gets a look of horror on her face. And then it is shown that Catherine is sitting in a chair, pretending to hold a baby, laughing while a fucking crow eats her titty. That crow was hungry. For some titty. For some some milk. It was trying to get milk. Uh, the next morning... Let's not be ridiculous here. Crows, then, crows don't eat titties. Um, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe devil crows do. <laughs> uh, the next morning, William wakes up and heads outside where he finds the goat shack destroyed. The goats are dead. The twins are gone. And Thomason's passed out in the dirt. And then he immediately gets attacked by Black Philip. The goat manages to stab William in the abdomen with his horns. Thomason wakes up screaming. We see Black Philip pull his horns out of William's gut and do a celebratory goat dance. Bah. <laughs> I was laughing. Like he he jumps up on his back legs and does like this. I don't know. I guess how goats celebrate. It's how the devil celebrates. Uh, I loved it. Uh, William manages to get uh, get to his wood chopping axe to kill the goat, but then realizes this must be his punishment from God for being so prideful and bringing misery to his family. So he just gives up, and he allows Black Philip to finish him off. We then see the goat full speed ram into William, 
knocking him back into his giant pile of chopped wood, causing all the wood to fall upon him and kill him. Now, I want to address the wood chopping. This is where we're at. So, every time William has some kind of failure or some kind of uh, like reason something doesn't go right because of his pride, he wants to do it his way despite a better way, or he lies, or he, you know, all these things that, that go wrong for him that are his fault, he chops, he goes and chops this wood. This is his thing every single time. So the wood falling upon him and killing him is supposed to represent his sins bearing him. But his, his, his sins were the end of him. That's what that represents. That is why the wood chopping after each one of these kind of major plot points in the story is important. And that is why I also was saying that uh, that scene, that line that he says to Caleb earlier in the film, where he's like, "We will conquer um, this land. We won't let it. We won't let it get us." That is him being so prideful that he thinks that he can do everything, even though it's very obvious he has no skills in hunting. He has no skills in farming. Um, he he's not good at trapping. There's, there's a lot of things that he doesn't have skills for, except for really chopping wood, and but he has this mindset that um, like he doesn't he doesn't respect that nature. And he definitely does not uh, respect the nature. Yeah, but that's what I like so much about the wood. The wood killing him is it. It is very uh, like like a like a symbolism of his sins all finally crashing down on him at one time and killing him. I think that is. Uh, phenomenal gonna be honest uh even without the wood i don't know if he was surviving those those two black philip uh horn to the guts i did not see that coming the first time i watched this movie that first hit because you know the way they shot it it's kind of off screen you don't see it see it coming at all definitely uh, took me by surprise i didn't see him going that way i didn't either you know, they probably had to shoot it like that because the damn goat was so difficult. There was, there's like no way we'll actually get him to ram him without killing him in real life. The, the goat actually <laughs> impaled him, that first one. Yeah. Like there was a whole nother, whole nother dialogue for that scene and that fucking goat just impaled the shit out of him. And they're like, fuck it, go with it. Just keep filming. Yeah, and I also love how, you know, he gets an opportunity to fight black philip with the axe like he he you know he may have may have could have killed him but he believes so much in this in, in this religion and his prayer he starts praying and he starts saying like prayer at it before, right but right before it takes that last shot he pulls back with the axe and starts praying it's almost as if he has so much pride in his his religion that he's going to like damn this goat with prayer before it finishes him off. He, uh, cause you know, the, the night before when he, when he broke down, when he was chopping the wood, this is when he tells God, you know, dispose of me however you will. And he picks up the ax and he goes to, you know, be prideful and, and kill this goat. And then this is the point where he realizes, no, this is, this is what started this whole thing. This is God's, this is what God wants to happen to me. He wants me to essentially die from this fucking goat. And he's willing to accept that. And that is mind-blowing to me. That you could believe in something so much that you're like, okay, finish me off. This is If this is what you want, then go ahead and do it. Well, it happened. Black Phillip fucking straight up, he horned him to death. He sucker horned him. He sucker horned him. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new thing he got sucker horned it's a new tiktok trend <laughs> but yeah i think i just i love william's death because it's it's you know the cornerstone of this story and this is really you know that we're, we're really seeing everything finally come to a head 
Uh, next, we see Catherine attack Thomason, blaming her for everything and accusing her of being a witch. They fall to the ground where Catherine begins to literally beat the shit out of her daughter. Thomason pleads with her to stop. Then she finally manages to grab a small garden shovel and hits her mother on the head with it. Catherine's blood begins to drip onto Thomason's face. And the sight of this kind of like enrages Catherine even more. And then she attempts to strangle her daughter to death. And finally, Thomason says, fuck it, and blasts her in the skull with the shovel. I mean, she went to town on that bitch. Yeah, I, I love this scene. Uh, the cinematography and the way the scene was set up with the blood dripping on her as, as Catherine's trying to strangle her to death. What makes this really intense and really kind of sad is there's spots throughout this movie where you see that Tomlinson just wants Catherine's love. approval and mm -hmm. love. Yeah, there's multiple times like, you know, after after uh, Catherine slaps William and she goes out and tends to the goat and like her mom calls her over there and like kisses her on the forehead or something she you you can tell she just wants that affection from her mom cuz her mom does not give it to her her mom resents her very much and even down to the last minute of her mom strangling her she does everything she can to not hurt her mom and it ends up being her life she she was either going to die or she was going to have to kill her and it, it's just kind of really sad. For Thomason's part in this story, Thomason has a, you know, what they called a self-fulfilling prophecy. She was constantly being looked at as this witch. I mean, even us as the viewer, even at times thought maybe she did make this deal with the devil. And we know, we know where this is heading. So this this part where Catherine's blood spills on her is to represent her old life being washed away in blood. This is it. Her, her leaving, this is it for this family. She's kind of done with this family, and she's about to have a new family. But yeah, they, they did it where the blood spilled on her to kind of represent... Um, you know how like, uh, like, like Christianity, they wash away your sins with water... She's been baptized. She's been in baptized blood. in blood. This is why it this is done. the last family member too. Yes. Yeah. This this uh, knowing where this is going, it, it's so ironic that she is accused of being a witch this entire movie, and essentially this is her family is what drives her to to the end of this movie. What mm -hmm. we see is is her going and and joining the coven. Yeah, so her mother's lifeless body now lays limp on top of her. Thomason is now covered in Catherine's blood. She gets up. She heads inside. She removes her bloody dress and passes out from exhaustion. Later that night, she finds Black Philip, and she asks him to speak to her like he did the twins. And after a moment of silence, she goes to leave, and then we hear a dark, whispery voice ask her, What does thou want? And she's like, What you got? Good answer. <laughs> yeah, I'll take anything. <laughs> I don't have anything left. Um, he then asked her if she would like to live deliciously. and She answers a quick yes. She's like, fuck yeah. We then get a shot of the devil's book lying on the ground. And in the background, we see the goat's black hoof turn into a black leather boot. I love that transition. It is done perfectly. Uh, he then instructs her to remove her clothes. He walks up behind her. He places his hand on her shoulder in preparation of her signing his book. She tells him that she doesn't know how to write her own name, and he tells her he will guide her hand. We then see Thomason walking naked through the woods with Black Philip following behind. We begin to hear chanting and see a group of naked women dancing around a fire. As Thomason stands gazing at the flames, we then see the other women begin to float into the air. So, it has been said that the twins were taken, killed, and turned into flying witch goo. And that is why all of these women are able to fly during this moment. Mm. That's what happened to them. 
Well, I don't feel bad for them. The twins sucked. Yep. They were the worst characters. Uh, f- I felt much, much worse for the baby. Baby Sam. That was, I felt awful about that. Uh, I love the way this whole ending scene is set up. Just the feel of it. Uh, her coming in and taking the robe off and being covered in blood. You know, we get a shot of that. I'm pretty sure they had a shot of that in the trailer. The Black Phillip turning into the, the devil and him walking behind her. And we we see this guy behind her, standing over her shoulder. But they only give you like little flickers of light on his face to where you can't really mm-hmm. see what he looks like. You can just see he is a very tall man standing behind her. So she was right. Black Phillip was, after all... I guess the devil, the devil or one of the devil's minions. And uh, anyway, yeah, I, th- I love the end of this movie, the whole thing. Um, I, th- I think it's very ironic that she spends the entire movie getting blamed for witchcraft. And it is essentially, that's what drives her to it. And from the very beginning, we get with her that she is not on it with her family's like the whole religion thing. Uh, she's not bought into it as as much as they are. She's very much more free will. She feels bad. She feels guilty about this in parts of the movie. You see very early on her praying for forgiveness and talking about how the sins and stuff that she's committed. So she's definitely more the black sheep of the family. I wonder if when all these events began, if Black Philip or these witches picked up on that and realized that she was she was going to be a witch. Like if that's why she was spared when all this shit started going down, if that's why she was spared. So the thing with with Black Philip was obviously only women can be in this um in this group that he has, this coven. He only picks women. And what Black Phillip did was he created an issue amongst the family. He turned all the family against each other. And his first goal and main goal was like to get rid of the men. The men have to go. That's why he, once he gets rid of the, kind of gets that set up, he offers the book to Catherine first because he really wants to get both of them. But he Ooh, gross. Why would you want Catherine in your? I would be like, she's way too much of a bitch. N- none of the other witches are going to want to deal with her. It's going to be a fight. She's going to resent some of the other witches. It's going to be a whole thing. She's going to still hate her daughter. Just would skip out on her. So, yeah, I mean, when this whole thing started, though, those were the two that he wanted. And he, you know, made his plan to. To do it that way. I would say Thomason is probably the main one he wanted. But yeah. But uh, yeah. So Thomason starts to diabolic, uh, diabolically laughing. As she also begins to rise. Closer and closer to the top of the trees. And then the screen goes black. And that is the end of the witch. Man I, I feel like this, this whole thing was all uh, brought about due to William. And his sin. Sin of pride. This is what essentially led him to getting kicked out and exiled. You you see what happens with Caleb in the woods and Catherine's cup was also mistakes he wouldn't own up to due to his pride. This essentially leads to Catherine's resentment of Tomlinson even further, pushing a void in the family, which leads to multiple of these events. Uh, Caleb... The whole cup incident led to the conversation that they overheard, that Caleb overheard, that caused him to go out into the woods to try to save his sister, which led to that happening. Like, almost everything in this movie that happens comes from William's pride. Yeah, well, the the whole, the story would have never happened if William's pride wouldn't have got him kicked out of the settlement. Yeah, I mean that's really what it stems from. I mean the settlement tried to offer him um, kind of an out, you know, and he refused it. 
and he not only refused it, but he like laughed at it. Like, <laughs> good, you know, I'm going to leave anyway. Like y'all are fake ass Christians. Yeah. And this at some point led to them uh, acquiring Black Phillip. And I wonder if that was random or I think that his sins are what led to like it was kind of meant to be like obviously at some point they got this goat. They didn't have the goat when they left. They didn't have Black Phillip. So they never say where Black Phillip comes from. No, um, I do have a lot of stuff I'm about to talk about that uh, it doesn't. It doesn't directly answer that, but it sheds, I don't know, a little more light on this whole situation. So, writer and director Robert Eagers has actually talked about how, on the surface, this seems like a horror film about Satan and witchcraft. But that is not true at all. The film's actual purpose is to show the horrors of religion in the 17th century New England. The most well-known of these events is the Salem Witch Trials, where over 150 men and women were accused of witchcraft. Eggers has stated many times that he wrote the story as an open interpretation as to if the family really was going through this with the witch and the witchcraft, or was this just a result of shared hallucinations brought on by religious paranoia. I I've, I've actually read that uh, about that theory that there was never any witches to begin with, and this was them uh, succumbing t- to the elements. They were starving to death, and well, there's there's that, and there's a there's a really important scene that almost nobody would know unless you fucking know about agriculture. But he holds up the corn, and the corn is eaten. So one thing that used to happen back then is there was this really common disease that would get on crops and you wouldn't really notice it uh, because it it took a while to like eat away at the food so people would be eating the food with this fungus or whatever it is on it and it would cause hallucinations it would cause people to be and they wouldn't realize they they would think it's fucking witchcraft weird shit going on well another thing uh caleb to the apple that he has in his mouth is a very small apple, which is a crab apple, which apparently has amounts of cyanide in it. And you would have to eat mm. a lot of them to die, but they were starving. So that would have been what led to his hallucination and then death. Um, I read into that theory, but I think there's a lot of things in this movie that makes that theory kind of a stretch, too. I know they kind of wrote it open-ended, so it could go either way. I'm going to go with the witch, the witch way. Yeah, um, I mean, I really just love the fact that on the surface, you would think that this is a horror movie about witchcraft. But when you do what we've done here and you actually really get into the story, witchcraft is just a thing in the story. The story is about religion because almost every scene in this movie not all of them include witchcraft but all of them include religion and god yeah even down to like how they treated women uh and 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 puritan christianity Mm -hmm. back then when when catherine attacks tomlinson she actually calls her a whore and a slut and tries to accuse her of looking at Caleb certain ways and looking at her dad certain ways. And she never does any of that, this whole Mm -hmm. movie. If anything, this was Caleb. Caleb was kind of being the one being perverted and weird. But him being a male in a Puritan Christian family, that's just a normal thing. Where for her, she was being a slut and needed to be sold off to another family to essentially be a sex slave until somebody married her. So Eggers spent four years making The Witch, with the vast majority of that time spent researching 17th century diaries and documents in order to add historical accuracy to the film. So this movie was filmed in 25 days, but he worked on it for four years. And like three and a half of those years was researching 
all of this because he wanted to be historically accurate. That is fucking dedication. Yeah. Unbelievable dedication. We did a really good job. I think I, this this whole movie was nailed. I think even just writing the script and how they talked would have taken a long fucking time. That was an actual... To study the, the language to be, you know, like hearing it in a play or something, that's one thing, but to actually study the language and write this script, I mean, there's stuff even with the subtitles, there's words that they used back then that I had no idea what they meant. I had to look them up. It's some of that is so different from the English that we speak now. It has its own name. And he literally went back and got all of that from documents, journals, all of that, and, and wrote this script with that. That is phenomenal. So we're going to talk about the film's metaphor. So the very core of this story is essentially the religious story of Adam and Eve. William taking more of the position of Eve in this version. So he got his family kicked out of their paradise for defiance and sin and now must face trial and punishment from God. In Adam and Eve, the devil has disguised himself as a snake and here we see him disguise himself as a goat. This is also hinted at when Caleb throws up the apple and the fact that the witches are always naked. After the apple, being naked became a sin. And when it comes to our main characters in this story, we see that they each give the devil an opportunity without realizing it because they are each guilty of their own sin. William, in his prideful consent, Catherine with her loss of faith, Thomason with her temptation, and Caleb with his lust. So they essentially took the story of Adam and Eve and put witchcraft in there and added some more characters. Um, I really like the fact that you don't you don't you don't realize it unless you really watch it. But each one of these characters does have a specific sin that uh, they kind of keep repeating. You know, they, they have, they, they display this um, idea that they're very godly and they, they pray all the time and everything's about God and all this stuff and they're scared to death of going to hell and sin and all this stuff. But then they keep, they each keep doing this like one thing. And you kind of brought it up earlier with where Thomason um, isn't, isn't really on the same page with the religion as the rest of the family. She's the only one that lives. She even says in the very beginning of the film that she has literally in her mind broken every single commandment. And I was like, so even kill, like she's literally in her mind thought about killing someone at some point. She is the one person from this family that isn't okay with this life. She wants more. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think that Black Phillip offers her what he offers her. He's like, do you want to live deliciously? He knows she's going to say yes. He says, do you want to travel the world? He knows she's going to say yes. Yeah, I think I think Black Phillip sensed that in her very early on, probably before this movie even began. He had sensed that in her and knew that if anybody was going to turn to the coven, it was her. Like, she had that in her before she even came there. And when all this shit went down and she... You know, she tried to save her family and explain herself, struggled with her faith. And then, you know, after everything went down and she had nothing left, she jumped at the opportunity oh, yeah. to, do, to to join. She says yes really quickly. Oh, yeah. And she absolutely. doesn't think about, she. her well, only response to signing the book is, well, I don't know how to sign my name. Well, she planned on signing the book before she went in there. She went in there calling out for Black Phillip. Yeah, I I just, I love the fact that there's this whole hidden, like, metaphor of this story. I would have honestly not ever seen the comparisons to the Adam and Eve story until I started doing the research for it. And I think that that's so cool. Uh, you know, great job. That is a phenomenal job. 
um, I knew, you know, I picked up on Williamson and I had, uh, I'd known Thomason was kind of had something going on with her, but I didn't really pick up on each character had this specific one that they kind of kept doing. Yeah. I didn't get that. I love how Tomlinson very early on though, they show her admitting, like you said, you know, she's broke every sin in her mind and. She's clearly not on board with the super Puritan religious stuff. From the time they leave, she's the one who doesn't want to leave. She's like, what the fuck? And them giving that to us early in the story, when all this shit starts happening and we realize that there's some witchcraft involved, the first time watching this, you do question at times, did she make a deal? Because you would think what they tell us about her, that if anybody would have made a deal... It would be her. But in reality, it, was, it wasn't it was that. Uh, she was telling the truth the entire time. And it was everybody else's sins that were causing this to happen, not her own. Yeah, it's weird to almost think of her, after admitting what she admitted in the beginning, it was almost like she was able to hold on to this idea of faith stronger than everyone else did. Yeah, but I mean, once it all went to shit, she said, fuck it at that point. <laughs> she said, you know, what? what's the use of holding on to this? I held on to this and look where it got me. I don't even think she wanted to hold on to it. I think it was more her family. You know, even down to the end, like I said, she didn't want to kill her mom. She loved her dad. That's why she snaps when her dad accuses her. And it's like, I just seen it. She's like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, you're a hypocrite. You've done all this fucked up shit. And nobody said anything to you. Like, you think you're the good one here? Like, you were the one brought all this shit upon us. And it's just, it's really interesting that she is, you think she's the worst as far as following the religion, but it's everybody else's sins that are bringing this upon them. The difference is she's being honest with her sins. She knows she's struggling, and she knows that she's committing sins, whereas everybody else pretends that they're perfect. Yeah, she's like the only one. I mean, Caleb, he's a little better, but... I uh, like Caleb. Yeah, yeah, I felt bad. I I thought he... I liked him as a character. Yeah, he... um, I think he just kind of looked up to his dad a lot, and that's what kind of led him down that path. I think he was just, uh, he was brainwashed from a kid. He was scared to death, obviously. I mean, he talks about it. He's scared to death that if he dies, like, he's going to burn in hell. He was very brainwashed, but I did like his character. Uh, The fact that he went out at night to go out in the woods by himself before the sun even come up because of the conversation they heard that he wanted to save his sister from basically going off to be a sex slave for some family. (laughs) Yeah, I I liked him. I felt bad. I don't think it was his sins that brought anything on. I think it was the parents, Ma- mainly William. Uh, so the rabbit. Back in the 17th century, hares or rabbits uh, were considered magical creatures and often associated with witches. Either it would be a witch's familiar or even the witch herself. So that is uh kind of why the rabbit was important. Okay. I figured either either the rabbit is the witch in disguise or the witch has this power over the rabbit or the rabbit doesn't even exist. They're just seeing the rabbit, but the witch is making them see it. Because it's very obvious that you know, he tries to shoot the rabbit and gets somehow uh, gunpowder blown back in his face and Even after Caleb goes missing in the woods and the dog, after he finds the dog dead and he's crawling through those branches, he's still, the, the, the rabbit is still guiding him through there and guides him directly up to the house. Yeah. The, you know, I I don't really have a opinion on if the rabbit is the witch or the witch is familiar. I guess it could be either one. That doesn't matter. Yeah. And lastly, Black Philip asked Thomason if she would like the taste of butter. So the reason for this is because at that time, I believe it was in the 1500s to the 1700s, 
the Catholic Church declared that eating butter was a bigger sin than lying, blasphemy, or even impurity. What? But this rule, by no fucking surprise to no one, was only enforced on the poor. Ah, uh, that makes a little more sense. Mm-hmm. Gotta have the the butter for the rich people. Yeah. Can't have you poor fucks How eating up all the butter. The fuck is eating butter a sin? Because they said it was. <laughs> I mean. Oh, man. All right, so ratings and kill count. We've reached that point. So the total kills in this movie is six. We have baby Sam, who was turned into flying witch goo. We got Caleb, who was bewitched and uh, orgasmically died. Uh, William, who was, um, what did we call it, sucker horned? He got sucker horned. He got sucker horned by Black Phillip, and then he was crushed by the logs of sin. And Catherine, who was stabbed uh, with a shovel by Thomason. And then you have Jonas and Mercy, who was abducted by witches, parentheses, later stabbed and deleted scene. Have not actually seen that. I tried to tried to look it up. But yeah, they, they were definitely killed. There's a filming of them being killed. With the twins? Yes. Oh, man, I wish they'd have put that in there. Uh, it might be on the DVD. I didn't. Oh, I, I did so much reading, I didn't get a chance to go through that. But And we got sucker horns. We got damn killed by the all hail all holy hand jobs like we got some, <laughs> some weird kills in this movie all right favorite kills so you fucking picked it so you're up um i'm going to go Catherine cuz she fucking sucks and the scene is very intense uh i i really really feel for Tomlinson she just wants her mom's acceptance and love and she's pushed into killing her, but when she does finally snap, she beats the fuck out of her. I do love when she's laying there, you see her scalp get bloody under her hair. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. I love I mean, just the way they set that shot up too with her blood dripping down on, on Tomlinson. It it was just a good kill. And Catherine fucking sucked. Yeah, uh, I mean, I had a, a real hard time because, you know, I really liked Catherine and William's kill, and it really wasn't because the what what we seen. It was really because of the kind of hidden stuff about it. I ended up going with with Catherine because I really loved that whole idea that Thomason is now bathed in the blood. And and welcomed into kind of her new life. She's satanically baptized. Yeah, I really like that. I really love the stuff with William though, where the where the kind of woods of sin just fucking and and then he gives up thinking that this is what God wants. He got killed by his wood. <laughs> That's some big heavy wood. That's some heavy wood. But yeah, he, I, he didn't call after four hours of having a having wood. Um, but yeah, I went with Catherine too. So rating. All right. Oof. This was difficult. This was I, difficult. I, every time I see this movie, I like it more and more. I give it a 4.4. 4. Uh, this movie definitely ages like wine. Uh, I'm a sucker for witch movies. I'm going to go ahead and say that. I fucking, I think I said that same thing last episode, <laughs> but I, I do love some witch, uh, some, some witchy women. I do. I, th- I thought it was very dark. Like, out of, out of all the witch movies, it's a very dark and more realistic variation of a witch story. I thought the story was great. It was presented in a very ambiguous way, which kind of has us question what's going on the first time you watch this. You know, you don't know if Tomlinson's a witch, if the twins are witches, if Black Phillip's real, or, or I should say if he's a goat or not. <laughs> But yeah, the story was done really good. The ending was a grim one, which you know I love, if you would call it that. It's grim and kind of happy, happy for Tomlinson. The acting was fucking incredible, uh, especially from Anya Taylor-Joy. I think she deserved an Oscar for this one. I looked it up. She did not get one. So fuck you, Oscars. You guys suck, and you, you clearly weren't paying attention in 2015. 
the cinematography was great. Now, I'm going to say it was amazing. It's better than great. I it was the amazing. Cin- cinematography. This is a fucking beautiful movie. It's it's shot very very cold and dark. Like that's the best way I can describe how it was shot. Is it it has a very cold feel. And I thought it was perfect for this movie as far as the setting and the time and what the movie's about. Overall, I think this is this is a a must watch for horror fans. Don't watch this if you're in the mood for just a fun movie that has a bunch of kills and stuff like you really got to pay attention to this movie and it's why i disliked it the first time i watched it you really got to pay attention put the subtitles on but if you really pay attention and you get the movie it, it's a must watch so cinematography we didn't get to talk a ton about that because there's so much other stuff but a couple things i will mention is one i fucking loved what they did with the woods, um, every kind of scenic shot of the woods is you get about the first two or three rows of the trees. And then the woods are fucking black every time. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. Them fucking woods are jet black. And I think that's scary. And if you notice their farm is surrounded by that shit. So they are like kind of fenced off of this like dark, evil woods and it's beautiful yeah it's it's like they're contained they're contained in the darkness which is everywhere so uh the cinematographer was talking about he actually filmed this in kind of a weird aspect ratio and it's more of uh like squished in sides compared to normal and he said the reason that he did that is because he wanted um when the the shots with the trees for the trees to be like to look taller and loom over the characters see i love when they do that with cinematography something that that hits a nerve or makes you feel a certain way inside and you don't even you don't even realize it's happening yeah and he said in the inside shots when they did that ratio it made it feel more squished and small in there so fucking five star for cinematography is a beautiful movie especially considering they used all natural light they didn't have any lighting um that's amazing Uh, i did see where the you know the director was talking about how the crew was frustrated because their their filming schedule was so fucked up all the time because they always needed natural light like they would only film on gloomy days they would not film on like a sunshiny day had to be gloomy so then they would shut down and wait for it to be gloomy um I think that's what wow. gave it the very dark cold feel great job i gave this movie a 4.8 I would love to give it a five. What what stops me from giving it a five is that I that you have to either a know a ton about like religion and Old Testament, or or b you have to kind of do what we've done where we you know you have to look for information that makes the story that much deeper. Like the story is good without knowing all this stuff, but I do, I agree with you. I do see where people went in the theater and walked out and said, this sucks because this is such a, a story that you think is one thing on the surface, but it's the, the real story is, is in the, is in the small details. Yeah. There, there's a lot of deep meaning to certain things in yeah. this movie and you can watch it and enjoy it, and it'd be a good movie without knowing those deep things, uh, I I think they'd just make the movie better. Now, knowing what I know now, it's, you know, makes the movie fucking so much better. But I do, uh, I do feel bad that people have to go out and look for this. Some people like that, a lot of people don't. They just want to go be entertained for two hours, whatever. But, um, I mean... Other than that, I mean, and and then the I love how accurate the the speech is, but the, it's it's hard to know what the fuck is going on, and that is also kind of a, a knocks a point off. Like it's, it's it's hard for me to choose. Like, does it need to be that accurate in order for us to know what the story is about? We just need to be more educated. Yeah, that's I what know. it is. We're too fucking dumb. 
Um, but that's my only knocks on the movie. And yeah, I think it's almost a five star movie. Like it's 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 beautiful. It's fantastic. It's amazingly written. It's amazingly acted. Another thing we didn't touch on is the fucking music in this. So they did not use a single electrical instrument. This was all acoustic string instruments in this whole movie. And I think that when if if you watch this movie again, like if you next time you watch it, focus on the music because the music with the cinematography is what makes this movie suspenseful and scary. That's what makes it. You don't realize it. As, like a good example is when I talked about when they're rolling out on that little card at the beginning and the gates are shutting and you have this super ominous fucking string music playing. You know that they're riding to their doom because yeah. of the music. Yep. And who's looking back? Thomason. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, man, there there's so much stuff, man. We could have did we could have did two parts for this thing. Uh I researched a lot of stuff. If you like this, go go look. There's there's so much information on this that we couldn't even fit in here. It's it's uh good shit. Really good movie. Like I said, every time I watch it it gets better. And it's rare to have a movie like that. There's still a ton of stuff that you brought up that like a lot of the religious significance and Adam and Eve and stuff like that that I would have never never picked up on and it was still a great movie. Yeah, there's some other stuff I discovered too. Uh, I didn't include it because I don't really know a lot about this stuff. But apparently if you're real familiar with Bible verses, especially from like Old Testament, there are things in this movie that are kind of directly um, kind of talked about in these certain Bible verses. So if you are very familiar with that, you will recognize other stuff that, that we didn't even know, like we didn't even see. Yeah, this is, um, I actually, like, am excited to eventually watch the movie again now knowing all this information, because I think it's going to be even better. It's a good, good shit. We, we, may, have, we may have to redo this episode in, like, a year and a half. <laughs> we'll just call it, we'll, we'll just list it as the VVH. Yeah. Um, all right. So once again, we thank you guys for listening. Give us a follow or like if you enjoy the show. Check out the website. Check out the socials. Tell a friend, a family member, or thy evil farm animals about the show. We hope to see you next time. Any last words? Don't get sucker horned and watch out for those all holy hand jobs. I will say, thank God we don't live in the 1600s. Die 1600s.